where did the universities come from? All different sources. In fact, they come from, on the one hand, some of the universities, uh, some of the cathedral schools. The cathedral schools that were built and encouraged by Charlemagne and later bishops, some of them turned into universities. Others, other universities, got started as informal gatherings of scholars that eventually built up the infrastructure of a university. And we can't identify with exact precision a date that they got started, but certainly we can say that by the latter half of the 12th, of the 12th century into the 1200s, the universities are getting going. And you start to see some of the great universities of the Western tradition. You start to see, you see the birth of Oxford and Cambridge and Paris and Bologna and the medical school at Salerno. These places are 800 years old and older in some cases. Ex this is an extraordinary advance. And what institution made it possible? Not simply the Catholic Church, but specifically the papacy. Henri Daniel Rops was a French historian in the 20th century who said, thanks to the repeated intervention of the papacy, higher education was enabled to extend its boundaries. The church, in fact, was the matrix that produced the university, that nest whence it took flight. The popes, for example, chartered more universities than anybody else in Europe. But they did more than that. They didn't just establish universities. They fostered and protected them. They extended all kinds of benefits to universities that made it possible for them to function and survive and indeed to flourish. Sometimes, I'll just say this before we go to our break, we who live in a university town I live in a university town, I'm not going to tell you, I don't want to hurt any feelings, but we sometimes love the money the students bring to the town, but we can't stand the students because they're so rowdy and noisy. That happened in the Middle Ages too, and the popes protected the students from sometimes the abuse of the townsmen. Let's see how we did it after we come back with the church builder of civilization. Welcome back to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. For the break, we were looking at the development of the university system in Western civilization and noting that the Catholic Church played a larger role than any other institution in spreading knowledge, cultivating the pursuit of knowledge, and allowing the university system to blossom. There was no institution that did more, and the papacy in particular consistently intervened. Now, right away, as early as the 1200s, as the universities are forming, we already see the characteristics of modern universities. They were not absolutely identical to our modern universities, but we see important similarities. For instance, that we had the same distinction between graduate and undergraduate education that we have now. We had the idea that you go and you pursue a fixed course of study, upon the completion of which you receive a degree. All these things were features of the medieval university. Now, in the ancient world, they had schools, of course, they had academies, but they didn't have quite these features that I've described. And typically, if you belonged to an ancient academy, it meant that you belonged to the school of thought that dominated that academy. Whereas, in the medieval university, there was no reigning school of thought. Instead, you had vigorous debate back and forth on a variety of subjects. But just before we went to the break, I specifically pointed to the role of the popes how did the popes help to foster the universities, apart from chartering more universities than anybody? The popes also extended the benefit of clergy to students. Benefit of clergy is, is a privilege that was extended typically, of course, to clergymen, which said that if you were to harm a clergyman, it would be considered an especially heinous offense. Also, benefit of clergy meant that if you were a clergyman, you could have your case heard in a church court rather than a local secular court, 
Well, this benefit was extended to the students at universities because, as I suggested at the break, sometimes the local townspeople didn't really like the students just the way they are today. A lot of people today look at the university students and they say, I like the fact that they've brought mom and dad's money to my town and they're ready to spend it on all kinds of ridiculous nonsense. However, I don't like the fact that they keep knocking over my mailbox. I mean, why would you get pleasure out of knocking over my mailbox? This sort of thing. People love the money and they hate the students. That's exactly how they felt in the Middle Ages. So sometimes the students would find themselves being hauled into some local court on trumped up charges and just being harassed in general. The Pope prevented that from happening and allowed the life of the university to flourish by extending benefit of clergy to the students. Any time there was any need to intervene in the university system, if there was some kind of problem, people knew you appeal to the Pope and he will resolve it. In fact, on numerous occasions, the Pope had to intervene to ensure that the professor's salaries were being paid. Now think of how pro-Catholic European universities would be today if Pope Benedict could do that, if he could intervene and get them a raise or something. Well, anyway, those days are gone. However, it is important to recognize that among the universities that were chartered by the Pope, there was something called, in, in Latin, and I'm using the church pronunciation, ius ubique docendi, which literally means the right of teaching everywhere. What that means is that if you got a degree at a university that the Pope had founded, had given its charter to, that you had the right, automatically, no questions asked, to go to any university in Western Europe and begin teaching. No questions asked. So that begins to foster the idea of an international scholarly community, because somebody coming from this university can just go and teach over at this one. And we begin to get fruitful intellectual exchange. Now, some people, I'm sure, have a sort of caricatured view of what intellectual life must have been like in a medieval university because, for instance, it's sometimes said that, oh, of course we had universities, but the professors had to toe the line, right? They had to say whatever the bishop wanted them to say or the pope, or they were always hemmed in and they couldn't just say what they wanted to say. That is so false that it would take forever to, re to refute it. Uh, to the contrary, as any impartial historian of the universities will tell you, to the contrary, the intellectual life of these universities was very vigorous and robust. There was hardly any question that was not rigorously debated at the medieval university. Now, it's true, there were broad theological limits within which this debate took place, but within those limits, it was open season for various questions being debated. I mean, arguably, there was more rigorous debate in medieval universities than there are uh, when we see in universities today. I mean, in universities today, we all know you have to walk on eggshells, you're not allowed to say certain things, or you're not allowed to defend certain types of people or defend the Catholic Church. We all know that. Uh, you didn't have that in the medieval, medieval university. You had rigorous, vigorous debate going on back and forth. In fact, what you would see in the afternoons after the professors would give their morning lectures was that a professor would get up before the entire assembled university community and he would, he would do something called determine a question. That is to say, some controversial question would be debated by skilled debaters on both sides of that matter. And they would both make the strongest cases they could for their own positions. And then it would be up to the professor to step forward and synthesize everything that had just been heard and put it all together and resolve it, come to a solution on the basis of this rigorous debate. That was called determining a question, and that took place in, in the afternoons. Now, I, I would like to see a modern university try something like that, but you won't see it because the professors are all tenured and they want to just sit in their offices and, and, and type entries on their blogs, so they're not going to want to do that. But that was what the university system was like, and if you wanted to get a degree in a medieval university, you had to do that too. You as a student had to stand up there in front of the whole university community and determine a question. That's hard. That's difficult. Now consider also that we can see the debating nature of our Western civilization. We can see it evident in the writings of this time, the writings of the early centuries of the university. Take, for example, the great St. Thomas Aquinas, who is admired by all civilized people everywhere, in effect. 